Well, I thought I'd tell my story so that I can possibly help others. So my story is really about having a slow transit colon, or what I would really call a no transit colon. Um, being a doctor, I actually knew that going to the toilet once a fortnight was not actually normal. I didn't know that when I was a teenager. Um, but when you've got that kind of problem for a long time, it doesn't really bother you that much. You get used to it. So I never really complained much about it. Um, you get used to distension and you get used to firm motions. Um, anyway, being a doctor, I gradually started using some laxatives because I thought that would be important after a week of not going and sometimes very hard stools with some uh, bleeding. So I gradually over the years have used some, just some laxatives, softeners, um, Coloxal and um, Movacol or Osmolax. Um, but over the last two years, I've had to use them morning and evening. And then eight weeks ago, I was using them consistently and was not able to pass any bowel motions for two weeks. So I saw a gastroenterologist who happens to have um, a case base of um, similar people uh, with functional uh, intestinal disorders. Um, funnily enough, I'd been to another gastroenterologist a couple of years ago and mentioned the constipation, asked for a colonoscopy, um, and then after the colonoscopy said, well, there's one polyp which I removed. You won't need another colonoscopy for two years. Um, use uh, Norma 5 for fibre, plenty of fluids, usual advice. But never really asked me to come back for follow-up. So I'm assuming that even he, despite being a specialist of the intestines, wasn't really that aware of the entity of slow colon transit. So I was lucky enough to find a gastroenterologist that was quite aware and had a whole cohort of, um, of people with slow colon transit and some of them um, have undergone a colectomy. Um, six months ago I saw a lady admitted to the hospital where I work and she'd had a clock to collect to me for slow colon transit and that's when I'd first heard of it and that is when my jaw dropped and I'm like what <laughs> um, so when I came to realize that I had the same problem and I might need a clock to me it wasn't as much of a shock um, so I've gradually increased the laxatives um, to the point where I was pouring in um, gastrographin, um, regular enemas, um, and then bisacodal, which is a stimulant, um, and some uh, occasional um, uh, I've forgotten what it's called. Uh, paraffin and agarol um, and also Epsom salts but the Epsom salts come in the form of Magnesia San Pellegrino which is much more palatable and doesn't taste like washing powder. Um, still um, I had a lot of trouble getting anything going um, and so I needed help and that's when I saw the gastroenterologist. I then underwent 
the colon transit study, which clearly showed um, slow colon transit. I underwent a defecogram to help show that my pelvic function was okay, so I didn't have the pelvic dysfunction that a lot of people can also have. And, and then saw a colorectal surgeon who happens to specialize in this condition. And he arranged for me to have a manometry, which showed fairly normal rectal um, and pelvic function. And, and then on Monday, I underwent a laparoscopy. And so at the laparoscopy, um, he reported that I have a rectal intersusception grade four, which is the worst grade before the intersusception becomes an outside prolapse. So that's simply a complication of the slow colon. It's not from straining because I don't strain generally. Um, then I saw in the operation notes that I have a very long colon, a very, very long sigmoid colon, which is um, attached to the mesocolon, but that was all with adhesions and almost twisting, I believe. That was good to know because that explained why I'd started getting pain when I bumped up all the laxatives, especially the stimulants. I was getting a lot of pelvic and periabdominal pain, periumbilical pain. So um, it helped explain why I was getting pain. And then to my surprise, even though I thought I'd been shifting things, um, he noted at the laparoscopy that the colon was quite full. Um, and I think um, he just wrote very, very redundant transverse and descending colon, which essentially means extra long and of no use. I'm still not sure whether we know whether you're born with this. I assume so. Um, but I also understand that the colon, uh, especially the transverse colon and the sigmoid colon, can lengthen um, with chronic constipation as opposed to the ascending and descending column, which are apparently more tethered down. So I'd be very lucky to see the right specialist. I think this is a very small world and there are probably a lot of people who have not been diagnosed appropriately and have not been, had the benefit of seeing the, um, the experts in this small world. Um, the main symptom that bothers me at the moment um, when the pain is managed is the distension. So the distension is over the last two months to the point where I am very uncomfortable and it kind of feels like uh, a pregnancy. I actually had a very rapid pregnancy with twins and polyhydramnios. So it feels like a rapid pregnancy. It's, it's, it's tight. It's very uncomfortable. Uh, it actually makes it hard for me to think at times just purely because of the distension. And um, so I find myself at night just trying to get some time to lie down and put hot packs over my abdomen. Um, I don't get so much in the way of tenesmus, which is that feeling of urgency. Um, and I... I don't get some symptoms that some people would get due to pelvic dysfunction um, where you have obstruction to the actual process of trying to empty the rectum. 
Um, but um, I think what I've learned from the literature, um, which was confirmed from my own experience, is that though one might be able to achieve some bowel motions with the laxatives, it doesn't necessarily equate to an improved quality of life. Um, I found that with the stimulants, uh, my quality of life was even worse, even though it was helping achieve some small amount of bowel motions. I actually, uh, with the stim regular stimulants, was developing a lot of urgency, was, which was leading to nothing. Um, and a lot of discomfort, which in my case, that might be related to some adhesions. And um, I guess that, you know, common sense management of constipation, um, a family and friends, dietitians, lay people, even general GPs, are all going to give you the standard advice for constipation, um, increasing water and increasing fiber. So when I did my literature search, I noticed that there was a study in 1982 that compared the ones with proven colon, slow colon transit uh, with the ones with normal colon transit constipation and their fiber intakes were the same. And there was some anecdotal evidence that increasing the fiber does not help when you've got a slow colon transit. And I'd have to say that that has been my experience throughout my life. Whenever my mother's tried to give me extra fiber, um, whether it was prunes every day, uh, bran added to my cereal, whether it was dried fruit or that Nulax dried fruit mixture, none of those things ever made a difference with me. I'm very sure of that. Um, so the, the, the softeners, laxatives, did have an effect at the moment I think what's happening is my colon is just progressively worsening so in the literature the early reports uh, would give an indication that after some time the laxative no laxatives no longer have an effect now I think this is a really important question do the laxatives actually stop having an effect i.e. do we develop a tolerance does the bowel develop a tolerance or is it actually that the colon problem uh, either the the nerve uh, endings or the stimulation of the colon has actually progressively worsened the laxatives still have an effect but due to the worsening of the disease we have to keep increasing the treatment now it might be hard for you to imagine but in one weekend i swallowed a whole bottle of gastrographin uh, about six mobicols or otherwise called osmolaxes um, about eight colloxal tablets, 120 milligrams, um, and a few aliquots of paraffin and agarol, and then of course the San Pellegrino. And four days later, nothing. So it just kind of builds up inside in this long column, there's plenty of room for it to just sit there um, until eventually, somehow, 
some of it is forced out. Um, so it looks like I'm heading for a possible subtotal colectomy, which is what my gastroenterologist has mentioned a couple of times. And I haven't yet discussed that with the surgeon. Um, the next step is for me to have a discussion with the surgeon based on all of the tests that I've had done, including the laparoscopy. And I will just have to weigh up the benefits and risks of a colectomy versus no colectomy. Um, and that, of course, may change with time because if this condition continues to progress, um, I might find that my quality of life is so poor that no complication of the colectomy could be much worse than I already am. So I hope you've found this useful and I would really like to help others out there be aware of this. I think it's not well recognised even in the medical community. I think maybe when nurses and doctors ask patients about their normal bowel habits, if they say I normally don't go for 7 to 14 days, then they may have a slow colon transit constipation. But the ones who are just bitterly complaining because they haven't gone for three days and they normally go every day, they probably don't have a slow transit constipation. Okay, that's all for tonight. Bye.